Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines and speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. With climate change taking centre stage at COP27, we speak with Robert Boyd, the regional lead of global sustainability policy and partnerships at Boeing. We ask him if the aviation industry, currently responsible for 2.5% of global emissions, can really go green or if real progress is still decades away. Do governments need to subsidise sustainable aviation fuels, or will it be travellers left footing the bill? Mr. Boyd, thank you for joining us on Frankly Speaking. Now, the aviation industry is one of the world's largest contributors to global greenhouse gases. And whilst the industry has been promising meaningful change for quite some time, environmentalists say we are still decades away from seeing that happen. Now, sustainable aviation fuel is currently more than twice the price of regular jet fuel. And although those costs will come down over time, it will take years. So, Frank Frankly speaking, unless we see real change soon, we know we need to reduce emissions and now is the only option to reduce our flying altogether. Hi Katie, thank you. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to join you. Um, yeah, look, um, there is a lot of action that's going on and has been going on for several uh, years, in fact more than a decade. It's not, it is not always well understood that um, the industry has been sort of committed to decarbonisation, actually set its first uh, goals back in 2009, and that's included efficient, you know, measurable efficiency improvements each year, and actually committed to have uh, carbon neutral growth and more or less get towards net zero by, by, by 2050. So this has been a long running um, campaign for aviation. You're right, aviation is uh, significant, but we should be clear on how much it is. It's approximately a little over 2% of, of global emissions. And I don't say that to discount the relevance of, of that. It, it is still a, a big and a relevant number, um, which, which we have to address. But the good news is there are several um, uh, you know, pillars of action that the aviation industry has at its disposal and is working on to um, essentially execute the, the decarbonisation challenge over the next uh, 28 years. Well, you say that uh, the aviation industry is only responsible for about 2.5% of global emissions, but that is significantly set to increase as we see other industries, take car manufacturers, for example, as they are becoming more sustainable. Now, predictions for air travel are that it will triple by 2050. Obviously, fuel consumption will rise along with that. So will it ever be possible for the aviation industry to remove carbon from flying? Yeah, and just to be very clear, I don't just as, as you said, I don't discount uh, that that number. It is very important, and you're right. In a decarbonising world, if all sectors aren't decarbonising at the same pace, then the relative uh, scale of emissions for something like aviation or shipping is hard to decarbonise. Sectors will, will go up, so it's critical. It, it is absolutely critical uh, to to decarbonise. So yes, look, um, there is a plan, a clear plan to uh, achieve net zero uh, by 2050, and that can be done. Uh, as I said, through various pillars. So just to run through a couple of these in terms of what, what they are. The obvious one that people are probably most familiar with is you, you've flown a new aircraft. That new aircraft, in terms of what it's replacing, can be anywhere from 20 to 25% more fuel efficient than, than its predecessor. You know, so these are, these are significant numbers and maybe bringing this to life a little bit more. That's, that's something like, uh, say, 25 tonnes of CO2 a day saved by, by using the best in class um, uh, modern modern fleet. And that can be a couple of hundred thousand tonnes of CO2 over its lifetime. So these are significant. So we need to um, ensure that we're using the, the most efficient modern fleet. And you might get say a 15 to 25% um, CO2 dividend globally. So it's, it's, not, it's not small. Then you can look at operations. So operations, there is still opportunity to improve further, but Noting, I mentioned that aviation's been at this for, for several years or even decades. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the easy operational uh, improvements are already there. They're embedded in the technology that, that we use today. 
There's still definitely improvements in terms of um, air traffic management. Um, Europe is a, is a good example that could be say five to 10% opportunity on, on the table there. That, that has to be addressed. Um, but, but, you know, there, there will be continued improvements, but they shouldn't be seen as solving the aviation uh, problem. They have limitations. Uh, and then we really get to, well, what are the, you know, what's left? What are the solutions left? The major one is replacing the energy source with something sustainable. So that's where we, we put significant emphasis on sustainable aviation fuel as really, I guess, going to do the heavy lifting uh, in terms of decarbonisation uh, out, out to 2050. And, and uh, probably many, many listeners have either seen or heard about ideas of electric or, or hydrogen as, as a potential uh, option. These are really interesting. These are really exciting. And there has to be continued work uh, on this, but they won't by themselves solve um, the decarbonisation challenge. Um, just to be clear, why I say that is today about three quarters of all of the uh, international emissions are from wide body long haul travel. You know, and the technology limitations don't allow for hydrogen or electric in that space just yet. Maybe it may be in due course, but today it's not, it's not a viable solution. So SAF is the key uh, over the next 30 years. So one of the other big changes we saw happened about a year ago. Around 200 countries came together and agreed to try and reduce emissions in commercial aviation. Now, this has been one of the most ambitious uh, agreements to date so far for the industry. How do you see that working on a practical level? Because, of course, you've been with Boeing this year, but you also have incredible expertise at IATA and with the United Nations as well. So this is something you've been calling for for quite some time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can speak very, very frankly about this. Um, if you had have asked me this question 24 months ago, I would have uh, said it's highly unlikely that we'd see an, an agreement such as what we have uh, seen. So the history here is uh, in October 2021, so about a little over 12 months ago, um, all the aircraft operators came together and um, agreed uh, at the IATA AGM through a declaration to achieve net zero by 2050. And, and that was not the likely outcome again 24 months ago. That was a that was a tricky, a tricky discussion, a tricky negotiation, but it happened. The day after that, all of the rest of the aerospace industry followed. You know, Boeing, Airports Council, International, Canso, you know, the uh, air traffic navigation service providers, the entire aviation family community agreed to the same commitment the next day. That set the stage for governments set the stage as well as I think put the spotlight and pressure on governments to, uh, to, to come up with the political agreement. It's been talked about for a long time. Um, it didn't seem like the likely outcome. However, uh, as discussions developed through 2022, there was increasing momentum. I think events like COP, whilst they don't specifically cover international aviation, actually help uh, it, to, to sort of support that momentum. And as you say, um, Katie, yeah, it, in Montreal uh, about two months ago, uh, there was in fact, yeah, 193 countries all found uh, the common agreement of net zero 2050, which is brilliant. The hard work does start now because it's agreements, one thing, implementation is going to be where, you know, success or failure is measured. I want to talk about some of the other potential options out there. You were talking about the importance of sustainable aviation fuel, certainly high hopes for SAF. Uh, your CEO at Boeing, David Calhoun, said that SAF is the only answer between now and 2050. But I think the big issue is the price point. It is more than double the price of regular jet fuel and it's in short supply. Uh, figures from 2019 show that SAF only accounted for 0.1% of global fuel use use for jets. Um, and I feel like we're still quite far away from the 2025 target of having 2% of global jet fuel come from SAF. So how do we try and bring these costs down? Do governments need to step in and subsidise or essentially will it be the travellers who are forced to pay with higher airfares? I mean, you're, you're absolutely right with the, with the numbers. It's good. It's, the context, I think, is really important because we do talk uh, in a very positive way way about sustainable aviation fuel and the, and the potential. Uh, but that realism around where we are at today is really important because uh, it shows what, you know, what degree of challenge lies ahead. I would also say um, it's good sometimes to reflect a little further back, say pre-2019, 
uh, where, you know, you go back to 20, 2009, 2010, it, it, it was genuinely a hypothetical, was it even possible? You know, so that um, there was some there was some tests and experimental flights that started occurring back uh, around that time, and that's when the technical committees got serious about determining a fit for what we call a fit for purpose standard to make sure that any um, replacement to fossil kerosene has the same safety uh, standard from a technology point of view to to go into the aircraft, and, and importantly, it was determined it would be a drop in fuel. So drop in means there's absolutely no change to the engines, the airframes. The airport infrastructure, it's exactly the same. So the chemical, um, the chemical identity of a SAF is more or less the same as a fossil fuel. It's just the feedstock, what has been used to make that, uh, is sustainable. So that groundwork, whilst you say, well, we're at 2019 and still at a fraction of 1% of total jet fuel demand, absolutely right. Um, but that groundwork that has occurred for 10 years is vital for you know, what's going to need to be exponential growth. I'm not as pessimistic about the 2025 number. I do think that uh, we are on track for around somewhere between four and six billion uh, litres of, of SAF by, by 2025. Still leaves a huge uh, mountain to climb in terms of scaling up. And as you say, you know, you're thinking, well, what are, the, what are these big barriers for faster scale up? Definitely uh, cost. If, if SAF was at cost, cost parity today every, and, and it was available, every airline would, would, would use it. It would be a, a complete no-brainer. Um, we need to uh, benefit from the efficiencies of getting scale. So that's really just uh, starting. There's a huge amount of uh, work, sort of research and development and technology, pure technology work on feedstock, uh, which can bring some of these prices down. Um, over, the, over the long run, though, I, I, you know, I think um, we're already seeing this in terms of different regulations that are... Uh, be, being brought in in different parts of the world, plus governments now uh, recognising opportunities to, uh, you know, not be reliant on essentially importing their energy sources for aviation and for other for other uh, users of of liquid fuel. So um, they're providing incentives, and these incentives are working. The United States is a good example with their recent Inflation Reduction Act that provides a huge incentive to to develop you know, green hydrogen and or um, renewable fuels for both ground and, and air, especially. So um, uh, there's a wave of supply coming coming along. And with that, I expect we'll see, uh, you know, price improvements. You say that you are feeling uh, more optimistic about reaching the 2025 targets. Do you see us reaching 2% of global fuel demand coming from SAF? Because even though we are seeing the progress, it does feel that the progress is slow. We hear from activists that it's going to be one and a half to two decades until this becomes more accessible. And as we know, I think the world cannot wait that long to try and reduce global temperatures. Yeah, the reason I'm optimistic is, uh, you know, what, what whilst there's you know, a finite supply today based on what, what is a very small um, cluster of sustainable aviation fuel suppliers that can produce SAF uh, today. There's a huge amount of production capacity coming online. There's expansions of existing uh, facilities and then there's new, there's actual new facilities being, being developed. Um, some of these actually start to come online even now, so almost right now, 2022, there'll be more in 2023 going right through to 2025 and beyond. We have visibility, I'd say, with some, you know, respectable granularity out to about 2027. Uh, and then you can extrapolate um, that, you know, that this pattern we're seeing now further out and you start to get some indications of what uh, supply growth can look like. Uh, but to your point, there will need to be some, you know, S-curve, growth shapes that occur so who's going to be uh, paying we, for that because you told me you told me earlier essentially in order to meet these 2050 targets we need a new SAC production facility opening every month around the world until we get up to 2050 who's going to pay for it is it going to be the governments is it going to be consumers there'll be a, there'll be a mixture I, I think of entities that you know support SAF growth when it comes to airlines airlines will make their own decisions in terms of how they account for changes in costs. Um, so some of the SAF use will be regulatory. We're seeing in Europe there's um, some mandates being being introduced. So that gets um, that that it will like most likely it's proposed legislation, but it will likely start in 2025. Uh, in other cases where you've got strong incentives, honestly SAF is not uh, double the price at all. It's with the incentives, it's 
it's competitive with uh, sustainable with uh, regular jet fuel. So who's paying for those incentives though? Yeah, so these are I mean these government government decisions with like any government policy. It's the it's the public funds that they determine how to allocate best for you know for the citizens of the of the country. Um, so it's not quite as simple as just saying that you know this is specific handouts to feedstock or to you know con constructing a facility or whatnot. There's the full economic analysis in terms of you know not importing your jet fuel anymore and producing it locally. These these are the benefits that. Um, some countries have already determined, but other countries, it, this opportunity is fresh to 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 look at. I mean, right now we know that uh, you know a lot of it, a lot of um, aviation fuel is or oil is clustered in a small number of countries. So I think the opportunity for energy independence for for aviation is is a is a great opportunity. And um, certainly more challenging. I mean, to, to I your point, do, hmm. does this trickle through to does this trickle through to um, to the customer? Well, well, every, everything in, in a ticket is. Is, is part of the cost of operating um, aviation. Um, I don't. I don't see if if you have a gradual introduction of SAF and you see these efficiencies begin to um, uh, improve uh, over time. It's plausible. This is modelling that's um, out there, both ICAO and, and IATA, to see uh, cost parity with conventional in the late 2030s. And that would be, you know, that's a that's a scenario that I think we. Uh, need to continue to to work very hard towards, and it's it's a realistic one, and it's um, you know I think it has minimal impact ultimately in the long run for the consumer. What are your thoughts about a carbon tax? Is that something that you would support to make traditional jet fuel more expensive? Is that one way of motivating the industry to move forward? A tax on jet fuel has um, always been a, a complex discussion because international jet fuel is not subject to. Uh, to taxation, and again, it was it comes down to um, uh, competitive distortion issues. So this this is a, a, a long-standing agreement under the ICAO protocol. You know, the 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 question of does it, it would make uh, sustainable aviation fuel more competitive relative to uh, to conventional? Um, however, taxes generally are designed to reduce demand. Um, so are they the most effective means? You know, I'm saying this as an, as an economist. Are they the most effective means to uh, to, to advance the, the the scale up of SAF? My view is no. Um, I, I suspect there will be some efforts to to try and do this. I mean, let's be let's be realistic here. Um, aviation, in terms of tax, uh, not on jet fuel, but aviation paid in 2019 about 125 billion US dollars in taxes. You know, the industry that year made 28 billion. So aviation industry pays, this, this is just the aircraft operators, they, they certainly do pay a, a nice uh, chunk of tax to, to, to the global community there. I think one of the other big issues we've seen, uh, something we've discussed a little bit today, is about the fact the aviation industry is very fragmented in different parts of the world. The, uh, the CEO of Dubai Airports, Paul Griffiths, told us on this program earlier this year that in order for SAF to really make an impact, we need to make sure it's available at every commercial airport around the world so that planes can refuel before they return home. Now, this is something the World Bank has also called for. They've said that uh, the development of SAF needs to expand beyond OECD countries. Do you see that happening and how quickly? Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. In, in fact, it's one of the, well, I think the good news stories about sustainable aviation fuel is that, um, you know, it's, it's actually it, it, almost every country, I would say, has some type of technology or feedstock combination that, that can produce SAF. So this is really not, um, this is not like uh, energy today that it is clustered in, very particular areas of the world where there's significant oil reserves. Um, you know, there's, there's more than 50 different technology feedstock combinations that you could use to make SAF literally applicable to any type of geography, any, any type of um, so, sort of social economic conditions. Uh, it, that, that opportunity is great. So I, I definitely agree. Uh, the, the, what's, what's really important is that perhaps the more developed uh, areas in terms of SAF uh, technologies share this uh, share this technology, you know, position at the moment, and make sure that all countries can develop at an acceptable pace, so that we don't just have SAF in a couple of you know hub airports. It, it may be the case in the early days, so we might think in the let, let's say up to twenty thirty, you might find that the majority of SAF, as it's scaling, is going to could be going through particular big hub airports in in several parts of the world. But there's this idea of in terms of accounting of book and claim, 
um, which is where you, you think about your uh, the examples like your, your electricity, where you can buy green electricity. Okay, the same electrons come out of the out of the wall, um, but that opportunity to buy those green electrons is there. So the same idea is being worked on for sustainable aviation fuel, such that everybody can access um, the at least the environmental credits of this as it's scaling in a physical sense to be everywhere. Because I think at the moment, it's certainly very challenging for developing nations with a smaller budget. Uh, let's talk about some of the other options, uh, battery powered flights. There's been some interest in that. However, they're typically only viable for short haul flights. The batteries are quite cumbersome. Uh, earlier, you mentioned uh, hydrogen powered planes. Uh, again, interesting idea there, but hydrogen requires so much volume to store it. It would essentially require a complete redesign of the plane in order to be able to store the hydrogen. So what other options do we have? Well, I mean, aside from, I mean, they're your two alternatives, your two alternatives we would consider plausible today, um, aside from replacing fossil kerosene, so using SAF. Certainly there is a lot of work going on um, with, with hydrogen. Um, there's still a lot of learning to do there. I think it's, it's, it's accurate to say we can do it. Um, but, but you're alluding to some really interesting questions, Katie, which, which is sort of, should we? So if you have a drastically different looking plane, does that mean we accept going and, you know, thinking about trying to redesign, totally redesign airports, could change the whole efficiency uh, of aviation in terms of uh, restrictions for how you refuel a hydrogen plane? You know, there's trillions of dollars of fuel infrastructure already, uh, either in the ground or pipelines going to uh, two airports, so you'd be replicating that. But these are really complex um, sort of questions, I think, that need answers before you can have a sort of a sensible discussion on, on and is hydrogen actually realistic uh, as a solution for, for aviation in the time frame we're talking. I think if we were talking a 2050 to 2100 time frame, you know, this, this will be a, sort of a different uh, conversation. So not certainly not to say that there shouldn't be continued work going on there, but it you know really won't be it won't be the silver bullet uh, for aviation decarbonisation. Electric's the same; it's it has its its physics limitations, which is you know getting that weight off the ground and you know relative to the amount of energy that that battery delivers. And of course, the the other sort of challenge you have to overcome, or you can't really overcome with a battery, is you carry that weight on the entire distance of the flight, where with a liquid fuel, that weight essentially disappears. It, it gets, you know, you land with, with a portion of your fuel load weight um, at destination. So that's another challenge. Um, electric will become interesting for short haul, but it's going to be very short haul. Um, we could say up to a thousand nautical miles. Uh, and that's, as I said earlier, that's not, that's not where the decarbonisation challenge is. Uh, to, today, the short haul uh, activity is relatively small, you know, around one quarter total um, of, all, of all global emissions. So, I mean, outside of that, you, you have the other things I mentioned, which are continuing to develop um, operational efficiencies and, and continuing to develop better aircraft. That's not going to stop at all. Okay, well, I want to ask um, you about developing again, better aircraft, actually, because, of course, Boeing has been involved yeah. in using SAF for quite some time. I know you've operated a number of SAF-powered uh, planes commercially. How are you changing the way you are designing the carriers of the future to make them more sustainability, uh, more sustainable? You know, when we look at the kind of technology that's being used in the cockpit, as well as how you're trying to make planes lighter and obviously more fuel efficient, how are you seeing that change? How will it change travellers' experience? Well, I think some things travellers uh, would, would notice, and there's probably some things travellers wouldn't notice, for instance, um, you know, people may may not appreciate the amount of carbon fiber that's in a in, in a, a, a Boeing and a Dreamliner or a seven eight seven. Um, but I mean, that's tremendous in terms of weight. Uh, you know, you know, it's incredibly strong and, and incredibly light. Allows the appropriate amount of flex, which can give better aer aerodynamic uh, properties from from the wings. So these are the things that I guess the the best you know engineering brains are continue to put their 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 minds towards. Um, each iteration of aircraft, as I said, they again, it's the engineers that take the credit for this. They they work out ways to make, you know, what seemed like almost the technology limit. They find a way to make it 
15 to 25 percent better each time and and i don't ever see that stopping I, you know i'm a huge proponent of human ingenuity and the 70 or 80 years of evidence already showing that you know there's a terrific track record on how to do this so that's going to continue um but but i mean in, with the realistic sort of lens here it doesn't you know these improvements are brilliant but they don't take your emissions um down down to zero Okay, so what about retrofitting carriers? You know, we're seeing someone like Ryanair at the moment. They've invested about $200 million to retrofit a number of their Boeing fleet. It's going to reduce their fuel burn by about 1.5% by installing winglets. Do you see more airlines doing that? Is that the best temporary solution we have? Yes. I mean, this has been this has been going on for, for a decade, I would say, with retrofit on, on winglets. Um, you know, any of these any of these uh, technologies that can, in a sense, be bolted on uh, and if they reduce a- aviation, such a tight margin business. If you can be doing things that improve your efficiency by one, two, three percent, absolutely. It, it makes sense to do that. You know, so all airlines um, look at this and or, or if not, should be looking looking at this. These are opportunities on the table to to do it, and all these incremental improvements are uh, are important. I was just going to say too, you know, in terms of how do how do we develop some of these things? What, you know, one good example is the Eco Demonstrator, which is a program that Boeing's had for a bit over over a decade, where sometimes in partnership with with an airline, and sometimes it's Boeing itself will will just use one of uh, or buy back uh, an existing an, an aircraft from an aircraft operator. Um, and then we'll literally just set it up as an as an experimental lab. You know, we'll put all sorts of uh, technology on board to test anything and everything. And you know, so far I think there's been about 300 different technologies tested um, on the Eco Demonstrator over the the past uh, decade. Many of these you now see being introduced into into the planes today. And some of the some of the tests, which I think are really interesting, uh, you know, because I'm so interested in SAF, is occurring with NASA. To, to just to look at uh, the emissions profile of uh, what's coming out of the engine that's burning on SAF relative to to conventional. So really starting to understand even issues like local air quality uh, of, of SAF relative to, to conventional. So there's certainly some big changes underway. How do you see some of these carbon reductions that we've been talking about at COP27 and other big events? How do you think that is going to change the future of green airports or airlines as they're being developed? You know, if we look at somewhere like Saudi Arabia, they've got a very new NEOM airport uh, being built there. We've also seen their new airline, uh, SIA, SIA, that's also uh, about to launch as well. How do you think that is going to change the development of, of names and other ones like that in the future? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think airports, it's, it's a really interesting phase for airports at the moment. If you're building a brand new airport to be trying to think a decade or 15 years into the future in terms of some of those things I just mentioned, what, you know, what, what, what is likely to be um, feasible, plausible, or, or actually implemented things like should you have hydrogen supply built in uh, to the airport, much easier to do this when you're building the airport than to try and go and do a sort of a patched up effort um by necessity things like the type of electricity going going to the airport you know do you have access to to a to a clean grid coming into your airport are there opportunities to uh, you know have perhaps have, have excess land if you're doing airport development that could be used for sustainable aviation fuel um development almost on site or you know as close to on site uh, as you might get so these are strategic things aside from the you know, what I would call the, well, b- b- any type of building these days will have um, strict environmental regulations typically, which get built into the, uh, you know, into the construction on the inside of, of, of the airport. But I guess some of those uh, energy supply issues are more strategic. Um, and I'm, I know that they're being Front, their front of mind consideration for, for new airport developments, absolutely. Oh, some exciting new technologies available. Uh, final question I wanted to ask you, you know, when we look at aviation emissions, I was interested to find out that it's actually frequent flyers in the developed world who the ones that are making the biggest impact on emissions is only 1% of these frequent flyers that are responsible for more than half of the aviation industry's emissions. Now, most of this is obviously coming from developed nations, but the future 
future of growth is expected to come from developed countries. So I think, you know, we've seen nations like the US and Europe call for a lot of reductions. They certainly have deep pockets in order to fund it. But what does it mean for some of these poorer nations who are only seeing their aviation industry really being able to grow, particularly after the pandemic as well? What does it mean for them? Yeah, it's a very fair point. Um, and it's something I'm, I often talk about. I'm actually very passionate uh, about this. I mean, this comes to the crux of why decarbonisation is critical. And what I mean by that is de- you need to decouple CO2 from, from, a- from aviation itself. So aviation for me is a, is a, is a brilliant uh, activity we've been able to develop. It's not just people going on a holiday. It's connecting the world. It's the economic benefits. It's transporting you know, vital goods and medicines and all of these benefits that come from aviation. So the question is, you know, how hard do we have to fight to make sure that that, those benefits of aviation are accessible? And, you know, I feel very, very strongly about this, that they have to be accessible for all. And that's that's why decoupling CO2 from aviation activity is critical. To your point, it is absolutely vital that every person in a policymaking position understands the different growth profiles that are forecast uh, around the world. You're right. Um, in 2050, so let's take the United States and Europe, they will make up about 40% uh, of, of global CO2 from aviation based on the current forecasts. So that's relatively speaking much smaller than what, what it makes up today. So just thinking that, okay, we just focus on a couple of countries and it's job done, it is not at all. You know, we need all, all of this same momentum to, to translate to China, to India, uh, to the fast growing parts of Asia, to all of Asia, but there's some very fast, fast growing areas like Indonesia, Bangladesh, South America, Brazil's a huge aviation market, and then Africa, exactly the same. So this to me is a role that ICAO can certainly be influential on, making sure you know they, they have a, um, a term, no country left behind, and that's absolutely vital. I'd say with Boeing, one of the things that we're you know, certainly focused on very much in, in the team I'm working in, which is Boeing International, is, is having a footprint in several of these countries that you just um, mentioned, Katie. So we're looking to play our role in helping these um, technologies and these projects uh, develop there, because yeah, we have to solve this for, for the world, and it's absolutely vital that uh, you know everyone everyone literally everyone in the future has the opportunity to I guess enjoy the benefits of of air travel just like many of us have in the past. Absolutely I think certainly a global crisis like this uh, requires a global commitment in order to get that solution. Mr Robert Boyd thank you very much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking really appreciate your time. Absolute pleasure thank you very much.